panel discussion with Dean, Skip, Tessa, and Oscar. They will have a discussion for about 45 minutes. If you have not checked out Oscar's workshop for April 21st and 22nd, please do so at the Lean Frontiers website. I do not want to take up any more of their time, so I will hand it over to them. Thanks, Skylar. And once again, thank you for organizing this for us. And thanks to Lean Frontiers, you do a great job with setting these things up. So welcome everyone and thanks for joining. So just a very quick introduction of the three panelists before we get into the questions that you guys have submitted. We really appreciate those. Uh, it sets the platform for something like this, of course. So firstly, Tessa. Tessa's new to Toyota Carta, having not got going with practice until September last year. And it was for that reason that I really wanted Tessa to be one of the people on this panel. I think sometimes there's a real danger that you get people like me and um, Skip who's doing it for, been doing it for a while and Dean to some extent who think we know all the answers to everything. So um, Tessa certainly doesn't because she's brand new. It was quite deliberate to get someone uh, like Tessa involved. So thanks Tessa for, for being a part of this. Um, uh, but her, what she has said is her alignment to the scientific method feels quite natural since she was previously a science teacher. And after being introduced to Toyota Carter, um, she was able to realise that those practices as a teacher fit perfectly within the manufacturing industry. She transitioned from the world of public education in 2017 to a position working for the operations director of PCI Pharma Services, uh, which is where she's working now. So Skip, Skip has been deploying Toyota Carter since the summer of 2015 through the Baptist Nonprofit Healthcare Group uh, system which is made up of about 21,000 people. He's been the main instructor for all their TK training events, as well as being a learner coach and second coach. He has also used TK to deploy other activities like JR and J JR, JI, et cetera, the TWI programs. Skip has an MBA and is experienced in a diverse industries, including automotive, machining, food process service, and healthcare. Last but not, not least, certainly not least, because Dean's from my part of the hemispheres. Mm -hmm. So Dean's a New Zealander. He started a more formal journey of building and developing Toyota Carter scientific thinking about three years ago into the way he works in New Zealand government. <clears throat> so at that time, he just started what turned out to be a two and a half year improvement project with a back office processing business unit. By applying Toyota Carter patterns and habits in his project, it fundamentally changed the way the team worked and his approach to improvement. So that's a very quick introduction on our three panelists. Let's get straight into the questions. And the first question, and, and um, Tessa, um, you're up uh, first. And I think this is a really good sort of balancing or um, uh, platform question. And it's from Sean Shepherd. And Sean, thank you for asking this. And Sean says, how is scientific thinking different from the scientific method? Um, the main difference I noticed is that there's a little more um, getting in there faster with the scientific method. You form your hypothesis and gather all your data, and then you do your experiment. Um, and I felt like, and I'm new, but I felt like when we were training and utilizing it, it was a little faster paced as far as, you know, you make a speculation and then you go try it and see what happens. Um, and so it was... Uh, that was really what helped me see how quickly you could apply the scientific method to the new world I was in. No, good. But you could see that similarity from the method that you would have been quite familiar with as a science teacher, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, spot on. Skip, you also, uh, I think you wanted to, if you had the opportunity to add to that. So what's your thoughts on the difference between the two? You know, I think I would not only echo what Tessa said, but I would say that you see this pattern of thought in so many other elements, uh, may have different words. So for example, if you think about a, a physician, what a physician does is they see a patient, they diagnose something, uh, they uh, might uh, ultimately uh, offer some medication or offer some kind of therapy. They, they think there's gonna be some kind of reaction as a result of that. Sometimes that reaction happens, sometimes it doesn't. So then they have to make adjustments. So that line of thinking they've been doing with patients for hundreds of years, we're now just trying to channel that line of thinking in our situation towards the actual work. And so uh, I think there's a lot of similarities when you see that pattern of work show up 
and so many other elements of life. Yeah, good. <clears throat> Spot on. Thanks, Skip. So, Dean, a question for you. This is from Ricardo Guerrero. And Ricardo asks, what are the most critical points in order to change the culture of an organization towards scientific thinking? Um, I guess the, the critical points is, um, for me, when I, when I did the work, I guess, bringing it into a, um, a, a, an organization that hadn't experienced improvement was about bringing the leadership teams, the senior managers along on the journey um, and then actually working from a bottom-up approach. Um, so that critical point is actually about working with people in the process and actually getting them on board or having the support and buy-in of the leadership change team. Um, that fundamentally helps in regards to the change process and working with them. This. So how did you get the, you know, that begs the question, how do you, did you get the leadership team involved in early on? What was your um, strategy there? How did you go about that? Uh, I guess the strategy for me was to, was to present and find a manager, a senior manager in the business who was open to have again and having a go. Um, that became the catalyst to help changing and others. Um, it was, they actually, for me, I was quite lucky in regards to it was a bold move that I presented to them an option of doing this. They had done a lot of work around improvement cycles, DMAIC, um, Lean, um, had people come in and done it to them. Um, so I presented a slightly different approach of working alongside them. Um, but it, it, did take, it did take me to find one manager that was brave enough to actually give it a go, that actually opened uh, the door. Was that, there was that, I can't remember his name, that was the guy who came to that first simulation workshop we did in, um, wherever ben, that was. Yeah, yeah yes. Ben, that's right. Yep. So he was the one you identified, dragged him along to some um, type of workshop or some example situation to see if you could get uh, convince him via that. That was the strategy. That was the plan. Yes. Um, yeah. I never forget Ben, um, Oscar, and talking about this. Ben, um, in the middle of the simulator, um, eyes just lit up because he could connect the processing and the um, weapon backlog to his own process. And actually right. then the realisation could actually see that actually there's an advantage of working this way. Yeah, good. So I think there's a bit of a learning there is that, um, and, and this is certainly a, a Mike Rother thing, that models don't change behaviours so that you can have the best PowerPoint, the best presentation and all that stuff. But until uh, you actually get into it or experience it, that's when the, the awareness really arises. Skip, I see you nodding your head there. Did you want to comment uh, um, no, on that and your experiences? Yeah, I think I echo what you said. I think a couple of things there is, you know, the old famous quote from the famous statistician, George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that's one thing to reflect on. I think the other thing connected to behaviors is, um, you know, just having the model alone doesn't cut it. In other, in other words, if the person that you're coaching, if the person that you're working with, with doesn't feel respected, doesn't feel psychologically safe, doesn't feel loved, may I even say, if they don't care, care for it, it doesn't matter how good of a scientist you are. It doesn't matter how good of an engineer you are. You're never going to be able to move that work forward. So how do you do, how, in your experience, Skip, how have you got, you know, because you've been at the forefront with Baptist, as, you, as I said in the intro, for five or six years now. So how did you set that platform that you just spoke about? You know, I think. The respect for, and the love and all that. You know, I think for us, uh, a, a big piece of it would be TWI job relations. Uh, TWI job relations is the best way I personally know to operationalize respect for every individual. And so when that is being practiced like a skill, it's a skill just like uh, the improvement cut or any other skill. When it's being practiced, then there's starting to be a relationship being built there. Um, I think the other thing for me recently, a, a recent discovery, is we are starting to practice uh, a humble inquiry. And so the, a second edition of Humble Inquiry by, by Dr. Edgar and Peter Shine is out there. Cannot recommend it highly enough because it's how do we go about asking questions? Uh, and so, for example, the premise of that is that when I ask you a question, I'm asking you a question that I don't know the answer to. So therefore, I need to approach it with a combination of ignorance and curiosity. In other words, I'm not just going through a formula and holding up my kata question here 
and saying, okay, you know, no, I'm asking you a question because I really don't know what the current condition is. And so I need to be curious as a coach. Uh, I need, there's a level of ignorance I have too. So I need to, so I need, that needs to drive me, but you need to feel respected by me. We need to have a relationship uh, because without that relationship, all the science in the world, all the engineering in the world is not going to move the work forward. Sure, sure. That reminds me of a line in the Toyota Carter book pretty early on that certainly gave me a lot of comfort or well, frightened me to start with because I was a project manager, uh, sorry, a project writer, a project plan writer. And the line is a, says something to the effect of no need. Uh, well, it's exact words because I've just popped into my head. Uh, no plan needs to cover everything. And that is OK. And right. I think that's a major, major hurdle to get over when you're when you go into the scientific thinking space. That's right. No need, no plan needs to cover everything, and that's okay. That's exactly right. That's okay. In other words, think about what that's saying. That phrase. In other words, I need to move forward. There's yes. going to be obstacles I'm not aware of. Uh, there are going to be holes and mines or whatever metaphor you want to use. The question is, how quick can I study and adjust? Study and adjust. Yes. And if you listen to people that are great in their field, so I'll use one personally connected to me. Uh, when you listen to uh, the championship Alabama football coach after they won the championship and they asked him, why doesn't he do this? And why didn't he do this like he used to do in years past? He said, I would no longer be able to be successful. If you don't learn to adapt, you will die. And so you've got to learn to make adjustments. Yes. Plans are good, but start off with the plan thinking, I know something's wrong in this plan. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. It ties in very strongly with that humble inquiry. I see where you're coming from. I must do what you suggested. Thank you. Tessa, um, a question for you. This is from Tina Barron, and thanks, Tina. Um, how, and it, it, how do you create a community of scientists that don't want to be scientists? Um, I think I can relate to this more at this point in the classroom than so far with our newness to Kata, although we are at that challenge now. Um, but with, you know, at the workplace or the classroom, I think you just have to get them in there and get their hands dirty and let them see the results because they got to see it to believe it and feel the excitement themselves or, you know, they're not going to be invested. They won't believe that it's going to make a difference till it does. Sure. So you say that you can relate more to the classroom than you can to the workplace. Have you not struck that issue with the work with your work at PCI Pharma? You know, with COVID and everything, we definitely are going a little slower than right. than the original plan. Yes. Um, so I have a core team that you know I've been working to to understand the scientific thinking in the workplace. But to branch out to the company broadly, we're kind of just just on the cusp of that. Yeah, right. So the core team that you started with, you uh, they're obviously very willing. Um, yeah. um, that original group that were involved with Sam, I think is what you're referring to. So they were clearly willing. Uh, you really haven't gone beyond that yet as far as um, and ventured into the space of people who may be less willing. Right. No problem. Dean, um, what about your experience? How do you create a community of scientists that don't want to be scientists? Um, don't tell them to be scientists. <laughs> uh, right. Um, uh, one thing I, I, I guess, and I've spoken to um, New Zealand School of Carter, who I work through here, and I, I think I've spoken to you, Oscar, is as I've been developing my improvement schools over the last 15 years, um, Maybe um, I came to the realization when I read the Carter book was maybe I learned it wrong. Maybe I learned the Western way of doing improvement is all about the tools and all about getting the results and all about the methodology. Um, but what's quite powerful and quite liberating when you actually step away from that and actually go, actually, it's just a way of working, way of being. Um, and if you think I was talking, we were doing some training yesterday with Oscar. Um, and it's that um, it's not a methodology, right? Um, and I think it's quite powerful, really hard for people to accept, especially in my part of the world, because we're all hung up on, we've got to do it this way, Agile or Prince2 or Waterfall and Projects. Um, and to try and get people out of that methodology and just to be thinking through, um, how do you do this? But I was talking to someone on the course and it was a realization that actually we do this all the time, right? 
as Skip was just saying, we test and adjust, but you probably do this all through your life. What shall I have for tea tonight? When I make a cake, um, I try something slightly different. Oh, it came out better than it was the recipe, right? And your family like it, or it came out terrible and you throw it away um, and you don't do it again. So um, to me, it is actually just working with people and getting to think through. The biggest challenge is, is trying to get them to connect up to the ambiguity and a little bit what Skip was talking about, going out into the unknown and that's okay. You don't need to know the answer because all the other work is that you actually start to plan and know the answer before you arrive there. Um, that's yeah. probably the hardest part for me is trying to get people to work in that ambiguity and it's okay. The answer will come. I think you've captured a couple of things there and um, and Scott Coppel, I see your comment. Thank you for that. Is that Scott has said, I probably you've all seen it in the chat. I always try to make them realize that what they, uh, the team are already scientists, whether they intend to be or not. And I think that's what you're saying there, Dean. We, we are, the reality is we are all the time. So if that's the case, how does Toyota, and this is not a question from the sheet, it's a question from me to any of the three of you. If that's the case, and I think you're probably right, to a certain degree we are, how does practicing the Toyota Carter patterns help us become a community of scientists in the workplace? That's the theme of this discussion, developing a community of scientists. And that's what Toyota's aim is, as we understand from the article back in 1999. So how does the Toyota Carter patterns help us develop this community of scientists in our workplace. So that's it to any of the three of you who would like to answer. And if there's silence, I'll volunteer it. So, Skip, so let, you go I'll, first. I'll jump in. Yeah, I'll jump in. So I think, I think you know, Scott made a good point in his comment. And let me just add to that. So I'm, I'm not necessarily, if I'm coaching uh, Oscar or Tessa or Dean or anyone, you know, if I'm trying to influence them, you know, I'm not going to get too hung up on trying to make them a scientist. Uh, they're a human. And as a human, they, most people want to get better. Or as Steve Spear says recently, when I was talking to him, you know, do you want to have less stink in your day? Do you just want to have less stink? And, and if you do, most people want to have less stink in their day. And so how do we go about doing that? I, I remember talking to a gentleman in research uh, during our effort and he went through our workshop, workshop and he said, you know, Skip, uh, can I talk to you afterwards? I said, yeah. And he said, uh, man, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this workshop, yada, yada, yada. And I, I was waiting for the punchline. He said, however, it doesn't really apply to me. And I said, oh, oh, okay. I said, well, tell me what you do. And he's in this research area. And I said, so I'm guessing that your job, uh, you don't really care if you improve at it. Is that right? Oh, well, no, he said, well, of course I care. And I said, oh, then I've done a poor job of communicating to you what Toyota Kata is, because all we want to do is find out ways that you can use the creativity that the Lord's given you to improve, to reduce the stink in your day. And so uh, I, like. think, I think Steve Spears right in that simple way of thinking. So if a person wants to be a scientist, great, we can have that conversation. If they just want to reduce the stink in their day, great. If they want to uh, collaborate and improve patient care and they're having a hard time in a certain area, great. Let's meet them with where they're at. It's the same thing with a great coach and an athlete. You know, um, I remember one time they asked the national uh, championship coach of the women's basketball for Connecticut. Uh, they said, uh, do, you, do you treat all your athletes the same? And he said, what a ridiculous question. No, of course not. They're all unique individuals and they have to be coached uniquely. And so he meets them with where they're at. And then I think once you do that, then you're going to you're going to create a common language. So when COVID hit for us, was everybody always meeting at their storyboards, you know, no, not necessarily. But were they practicing the improvement kind of, oh, yeah, they were they were studying and adjusting like nobody's business because a global pandemic has punched them in the mouth and they got to figure out how to maneuver through this. And so I, that's that's my general thoughts on that. Now, I, I like that statement you've made of meet them where they're at. It reminds me of Mark Rosenthal said to me in Austin last February, uh, the last trip I ever went on. Um, trip away out of this country, uh, Mark said to me, teach to extend their knowledge threshold, not demonstrate your own. And Beautiful. I think that's, yeah. yeah I think Mark, that's really always, Mark, Mark always has a way of saying things. That's he does, doesn't he? That was spot on. 
I'll never forget it because it was, and I think that ties in with not jamming something down people's throats, but meet them where, meet them where they're at in terms of the philosophies or. And, and, and you know, I can just one last comment. I can relate to that. What I, and I went to college on a wrestling scholarship and my coach knew how to. You obviously failed. Yeah. I, well, look at me, right? That's right. So, <laughs> You know, my coach knew how to treat me uh, versus my best friend. My best friend, he gave him a pat on the backside and said, hey, good job. But for me, I was someone that thrived on being kind of pushed and nudged and hassled and, and, uh, and kept on being pushed. We were completely two different individuals, but the coach was smart enough to meet us with where we were at uh, to get the results he needed. Sure, sure. Thanks. I'll just pick up um, on Maria has also asked, how do you, and this ties in a little bit to one of the earlier questions, but maybe we can go back to it. How do you convert members in the senior leadership team to believe that Carter works? Um, and I've just got a comment on that. One of the things I think as a senior leader, the senior leader has to be ready. The senior leader has to be ready to be humble, to your point, Skip, and has to be ready to know that they don't have all the answers. And if the senior leader is not ready to know that they don't have all the answers, um, and that this has really come to me with uh, trying to get this sort of stuff going in Southeast, in Southeast Asia, where the Southeast Asian work culture is the manager provides the answer. So where we have a culture of the manager provides the answer, gee, it's, a, it's hard yards. Do, Dean, would you like to comment on that further or uh, Tessa or Skip? You know, how do you get those managers, how do you move managers who think it's their job to provide the answer? Yeah, that changed the question slightly on me. Um, the, the first part of the question that you talked about, Oscar, is around... Go back to um, that part. Yeah, that first part is around um, what we, what um, Darren, our trainer yesterday, talked about, find something you're doomed to be successful at, doomed to succeed, right? Something small, because people believe when they see, um, bit of doubting Thomas in there, I guess. Um, how do you help people actually start to see this as a way? And um, sometimes it is that we start too big, right? Um, the value of having senior management on board though, right? Because it takes all parts to make the magic and success happen because they need to be able to help remove roadblocks. But the biggest value that I got managers on board with was using a term they use in Agile about demos, demonstrating. So as we started to move through the test cycles, we started to present to the wider team. They could see the benefit, they could see the understanding, they could see the obstacles and the way it was starting to work. Um, and then for their, if they love their people, so if they truly are a people leader, right, and they love them, they want them to be successful, they see their people starting to get engaged and starting to actually see success and starting to see the value in it, um, what starts to build that. But my advice to anybody doing it, start really small and take them on that horrible word of the journey, right? Go with them, lead them by the hand. Don't try and tell them this is a model that works and it can be successful for them. So start on a, so really, and I think we talked about that yesterday in that group, start with a group of uh, really the, the early days, it's not about kicking goals for the, for the business. Yes, it'd be nice if we mm. do, but in the early days, it's more about le developing a skill and finding mm. some small-ish platform to develop the skill. And if we happen to kick a goal at the same time, well, that's a good thing, but, mm. and that's, that's great, but it's not actually the goal early on. The goal early on is to develop the skill. Tessa, what about with your senior management? Obviously, they made a decision a year or so ago um, to have a crack at this. What was, how did that, just tell, how did that play out? Was it as a consequence of you attending the summit or how did that sort of work through management and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, I, I was going um, through some J programs and train the trainer for TWI and focusing on the training side of things. Um, but because of that, the directors were kind of looking into it and they stumbled across Kata and said, what do you know about this? And I was like, well, not too much. You know, I heard a little bit about it at the summit um, and they were really excited about it. And so we're going to do this. Um, and so we, we had those groups um, within that small little team. And because we divided up, I can only speak to, to my group, but for us, we were so focused on, um, our initial experiment and so sure we'd see the results. And that was really good for us to see that we do usually enter things thinking like we already kind of know. 
but we yeah. realized that didn't make the impact we thought it was gonna it actually ended up being something totally different so sure but management stayed on board through that um so in, so how did that come about you know because sometimes we don't get the results straight away was there any challenges with keeping management on board through that Tessa? Um, I think, like I said, I don't know what the other group's experience was. I get the feeling maybe they didn't see the same, have the exact same experiment, experience that my team did. Um, and maybe because of that, they weren't as excited at the end of it. But for my team, um, you know, we walked away like, oh, wow, you know, this is a great tool to have in the tool belt and excited to try it again. But, and what about the, you said the managers, Tessa, were, you know, they really wanted to have a crack at this, your senior people. Do you know what it was that they saw in their minds? What was it that they saw that made them think, yep, we want to have a crack at this? Um, well, you know, we're a very improvement driven company, obviously. And um, they're always, they're pretty open always to trying something new. I'm very lucky in that way that, you okay. know, they just want to see oh what's this all right let's let's dig into that and see if that works um right. so they're definitely not closed-minded um at the company i'm at so in some ways it's an experiment at a high level yeah <laughs> <laughs> very good um thank you so dean a question to you from christina rower i apologize if i don't um uh if I got the pronunciation wrong, but Christina said she would love to have examples of how Toyota Carter has been rolled out in your organization and what, what have been the main blockers and challenges? Um, so for me, um, I work in non-manufacturing. So I challenge Oscar about this. When, when we go to a lot of training, especially the stuff that's um, based out at Toyota, it's always linked back to the manufacturing cycle. Um, so I work in a service industry um, um, the success there is um, most of the work you do in, in, in a service industry still has a production element to it, if you ask me, right? Still has procedures, processes, and things that people follow. Um, the, the challenge with it is, is to try and people away from that mindset that actually um, that there is a process and a steps followed. If you can map that out with people, it helps them work through that to understand that. Um, but a lot of successes come around um, not, um, I guess, if I go back to my Six Sigma days um, and the demonic cycle, is not spending time, six months, eight months, doing a piece of work where you come out with an idea that let's give this a go, um, that you can actually get in really quick and get moving um, with it. In the service industry, as I said, we worked, I worked alongside a back office over two years that has removed their backlogs um, and give you context, they had up to 2,000 widgets that could take um, four or five hours to complete. Um, and through Carter and other bits and pieces, they've actually done that. But the part that moved me in the service industry was that um, over a four month period, we went in and tested a new way of working, introduced that and changed it across 60 staff. So 60, the value in the 60 p yeah. Um, the value in it is it does the change management or the way I do it, I hope I do it the same way, is that um, we actually leave it live in production. So we manage the risk of live in production um, in a service environment. So dealing with customers on um, uh, application forms or inquiries over the phone. Um, and we leave the experiments live in production. And as we start to find them work, we leave that in that production and take the ones out or tweak around the obstacles. Um, and as we do that, we actually change the way they work over time. That actually starts to prove and start evident. So um, once again, go back to our training you say, because we got the same question in the, the training course yesterday. The hardest thing in the service industry is about finding the measure. Right? How do you find the rigor and the measure to actually help them with that? Um, and my advice on that is there's always a measure, right? You always have either customer satisfaction or staff satisfaction in there. There's always a way to find a way to measure it. Sure. Thanks. Skip, would you like to comment on that? Um, how you've done it with uh, 21,000 in your organisation. So we'd, um, people would love to hear how you've coped with that sort of thing over the last, with those yeah. numbers over the last five or six years. Well, so I don't want everyone to think that all 21,000 people are no. practicing kata, but, you know, <laughs> we started with one hospital and I know, Oscar, you know, Brad Parsons, he was a uh, CEO at our Northeast Arkansas Hospital. He's now over 
our flagship hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, but we started with one hospital and this formula we kind of followed along. Uh, actually, it was me and Mark Rosenthal. We started with Brad, the CEO of that specific hospital and his administration team. We said, you got to be involved with this uh, or there's no sense in us moving forward. They said, no problem. And we did training that was simulation. It was fun and uh, with dominoes. And we, we had these challenges that everyone said couldn't be accomplished. And then they do accomplish it. And then what we did in addition to the uh, administration team, we chose areas. If I remember right, we chose five areas. And we said, okay, let's say ICU is one of those areas. Let's say the, the ER is another area. We said of those areas of the ICU and of the ER, uh, what are the individuals in, tell us about the organizational structure in that area. And we picked three people from the ER, let's use it as an example. We picked someone that we thought eventually would be a second coach, eventually would be a coach, and then ultimately someone that would be what we'd call a learner. So we picked uh, five areas and we had those three people per those five areas. You can see where we're headed with this. The objective is we are not going to do training for the sake of training. We are going to do it so that the very minute that the training is over, we're getting to work. And so then what we did was we did the training and uh, we started to articulate what are the challenges in those five areas because we just didn't pick any five areas. Those were five areas that leadership felt needed there must be improvement made in those areas. And there was a reason why. So then we started writing out the challenge. Then what we did was, let's say that we had a director in the ER and yes, that director might ultimately become a second coach, but we said, hey, director, would you be willing to humble yourself and start off as a learner? All right. no, no one pushed against that. Uh, and, uh, and we're gonna rotate you through a process and you'll eventually, we're gonna get you to a second coach, but it's naive to think that you could be a coach or a second coach had you not ever been a learner. And I'm thinking of one uh, nurse director named Jackie. And so we did that with her and we asked her to stay there for 10, um, 10 weeks. So uh, 20 minutes a day, every day, Monday through as Friday. As the learner, as the learner, the learner. for 10, for 10, yeah, even 10 though weeks. She, that's right. Even though she had 400 people reporting to her, she was a director. We said, can you start off as the learner? She said, no problem. But she made a choice not to stay there 10 weeks. She made a choice to stay there six months. <laughs> then uh, when she transferred to being a coach, I remember the very first day she looked at me and said, Skip, this coaching thing's really hard. And I said, I agree, but can you elaborate? She goes, well, I've never thought about myself being a command and control type person that just gives orders. I said, yeah, you thought everyone else was that way, not you, right? She goes, right. She goes, but I just realized it's a lot more comfortable to give a directive than it is to coach. So then she, <laughs> then she sat in the coaching role for six months, which is not the norm. We normally ask for people for 10 weeks. And then she, we moved her into the second coach. Years later, if I needed someone to coach me today, if I needed someone to coach Skip, I would, I would pick Jackie in a heartbeat. So that was a structure that we used. What happened at that one hospital is once we started seeing traction, we found every opportunity to celebrate, jump up and down, tell everybody about it. That created an energy that created a macro pull for our other 21 hospitals. So then what you had was people saying, hey, when can I get this kata training? When can you come? And so now that put me in the driver's seat and say, well, we can look at that doing, but are you willing to go through the training? Because we're not gonna provide it unless the administration goes through it first. You know, yeah, right. well, and they were hearing about all this good news. So that's kind of how we started off. And then another thing that Dean said, or Tessa, I wanna make sure I, uh, we also kata our kata. So in other words, uh, we do what Mike Rother calls a, uh, a uh, advanced group, we call a shepherding group. And that shepherding group is kata-ing your kata. So in other words, right. where do you want those five groups? I'll, I'll just go through the process. Where do you want it to be at uh, a year from now? Where mm -hmm. is it at today? Where could it be at in a couple of weeks? And so we were kata-ing the kata at a high level. 
understand makes sense skip probably is something that i know people ask a lot and it intrigues always intrigues me you said you picked you know in the early days <clears throat> at the flagship hospital you picked three people from each area or whatever it was what were the what were the um attributes of those people you picked to what to be able to increase the chances of success for for us, right or wrong, what we did at first was in a particular area, we were looking at the long-term structure and saying, who would be the natural improver? Who would be the natural uh, coach? Now, they weren't going to be able to start off that way, but, you know, and then who who might be a second coach? Now, a second coach might be someone that transfer, that is over many departments, so we were looking at that, a big piece of that, uh, because if they're already a supervisor in a leadership role, then we want them to think about how do they improve their work, because we, we like to say improving the work is the work. If they're already a manager in that area, then we need to learn for them to lead in a different type of way. And so that was how we did it initially. Now, every hospital is a little different. We have hospitals with 7,000 people, and we have hospitals with you know, 500 people. And so we had to get creative and because not everyone had the same structure of directors, managers, yeah. you know, so, so we had to get a little creative there. <clears throat> Very good. Thank you. Tessa, Susan Janice has asked, and hello, Susan, how are you? I haven't seen you for a while. Good to see you're included uh, in uh, part of this. So, Susan asked, um, while practicing scientific thinking, what were the missing skills that were uncovered for learners or coaches? Tessa, if you can answer that, um, please. I kind of touched on it um, when I was discussing our experience, experience with the training, um, just learning to not jump ahead and try and find that solution right away um, was the biggest takeaway and kind of shock, I think, for all of us, because even though I'd been a science teacher, I hadn't really thought about the fact that that all applies in this new role. Um, you know, I just was like, oh, I'm, I'm in this world now. And so it was really enlightening for me to see that and to have to stop and really work on not doing that anymore. Yes. So the, um, the skill that was missing was the uh, how would you put that into a, a skill like that? That how how would you transfer that to a, a you know? How would you describe that as a skill? Do you reckon that ability to stop? Um, I think maybe just um, I don't I don't even know how to sum it up in like one word, but just not always trying to grab that solution and have that hypothesis and not test it first. Just oh, yeah, no, that's let's, good. Let's run with that. <laughs> Yeah, I think you've captured something important there to, um, you know, and it's something I've become aware of in the last six to 12 months is that I reckon in our field that we're all probably four of us are in, just about everything we do is a hypothesis. I think that's the reality. Um, and I've become very conscious of that. And as soon as you're working with a new group of people, I might have done it before a million times, but as soon as I do it with a new group of people, I now have a new hypothesis. It might have worked with another group, but it doesn't mean it's going to work with this group. So I think there, I think you've grabbed it there. And from my point of view is the recognizing that just about everything you do in continuous improvement in a lot of ways is, is a hypothesis. So therefore, if it is, a, if we accept that, then there's only, there's only going to be one reliable way of moving forward and thinking forward. So thank you for bringing that up. I think you grabbed something. Um, Skip, you were, nodding on that hypothesis thought. Do you want to add to that? I think you're absolutely right. I think when the pandemic hit, you know, uh, the phrase that I used uh, a lot was, L don't let this pandemic go to waste. And so, uh, and that was not to be insensitive yes. to the real pain that people are feeling. But the reality is this was a disruptor that uh, I think exposed a lot of industries and even exposed my group uh, I saw that there were areas where we were too fat and happy. You know, we were, uh, we needed to think, we needed to practice what we were preaching. And so how do we, how do we do that? So uh, even in our, even in our kata training, it, you know, it used to be uh, three days and it was, uh, 
uh, four hours, three hours, three hours. We, we shifted that to three days, uh, two hours each. And I actually believe we produced something better. And, uh, and so how do we practice the kata on our own? Whether, whether we're practicing it on how to deliver training, whether it's on improving our health. Uh, we, we've had people that uh, have lost 75 pounds and uh, cut their blood pressure in half by practicing kata on themselves, right? Uh, and so I think that what you're saying, Oscar, is right. At the end of the day, everything's an experiment, everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what I think is going to happen and what actually happens many times are two different things. And that's but, okay. That's okay. But not only is that okay, that's great. What do I learn from that? Uh, you, Emma, my friend that works at Amazon, they have a phrase there, fail quick, fail often. Yes. You know, how do I study and adjust as quick as I can uh, with not taking the failure as part of my identity and not taking the failure too personal? It's just a part of the process to move forward. Yeah, exactly. Um, we've got four minutes left. So this, prop, this may well be the last question. It's for you, Dean, from Gabriella Drescher. And Gabriella asks, do you, uh, do you use the Carter questions between coach and learner in everyday work or just for projects? Uh, that's a real good question. Um, I currently use it while, um, I use it more formally in my thinking when I'm working inside um, improvement events, but um, I now try and weave it into just everyday conversations. Um, because it actually it's just it's a way to get people thinking right um and i like that thinking from toyota if you go to toyota you don't see this up on a wall as a here's a set of questions we ask how do you get it to be an eight how do you get it to be the way people think um and it just probably links back to what we were just talking about before i was just going to have value and i don't think i was but i will is isn't it interesting i think it's in the in the, the toyota carter book in crisis management why is it that everybody practices Toyota Kata, right? You went through the pandemic, the may I've seen the world change in our industry in regards to the way they think of the things they couldn't do, but because they were forced to do it, they started practicing the Kata and they didn't know they were doing it. And it's real yeah. powerful to go back to industries now and say, hey, when you went through the pandemic, you tried all these things, you were managing risk, you were actually trying things, you were adjusting as you went because you learned, you didn't know how you're going to do it differently. Um, and to see teams in New Zealand go from having to work in the office to work in Zoom environments, right? Being locked down, we had a lockdown for only five weeks, so um, we were quite lucky. But it changed the way, and they had to keep on testing and learning. Um, the power now is to link managers back up to them and say, you did it that way. Why can't you just keep on doing it that way? Yeah, um, exactly. And that's that, just getting them to think that way differently. And I think it's a transition, Dean. I mean, I know from my own personal experience, I started by using the questions very deliberately in a coach learner mm -hmm. situation. I started that way, but then I started that then as the light sort of gradually came on, um, you know, you trans and as you build confidence in the questions and build confidence in listening, um, then you start that starts to, uh, you know, it starts to become, that's the whole point. It starts to become an eight and you can start to build it into everyday conversations without uh, almost without realizing, I guess. And I think the other thing it certainly tests you and, and give, when you start to get the confidence is when you realize you're a better listener. It certainly was for me. It's, it mm. certainly forced me and encouraged me to be a better listener. And as I was able to do that, I was able to make it a, more part of a natural conversation than forced, you know, reading from a pocket card. I think our, our, our time is up. So Tessa and Dean and Skip, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us on this. We've only got through about eight of 10 of the questions, which is, and we had about 50 put in, which is completely normal. That's what's happened in other ones of these I've done. But terrific conversation, and I really appreciate the time that um, all three of you have put into this. So enjoy your days, and everyone who listened, very uh, appreciate your attendance, and trust you've got some value from hearing what these guys have had to say. So thanks everyone and enjoy your day. Thanks guys. Yeah.